Shalom. This is about wrestling and who did Jacob wrestle with and what does it mean for us. When I was in high school, I didn't play any sports. I tried out for football and then my debate coach said it's either football or, or debate. So my only sport was my mouth. And then in college, I went to a college with a terrible sports program, University of Chicago. I tried to play intramurals. First time I tried football, I got blocked so hard my arm hurt for a month. Decided that was it. Then I said, I'm a big guy. I'm strong. I can go wrestle. So I went out for wrestling. Of course, I was the heavyweight division. And this monster came and pinned me in three seconds. And that was the end of my wrestling career. Then my son got into res professional wrestling, so I took him as a good dad to a professional wrestling match. You ever been to one of those? It was unbelievable. Weirdest experience. Well, in any case, wrestling is a big part of ancient folklore. The Hittites, the Amalekites, the Urites, the Hittites, everybody had wrestling in their traditions. Gilgamesh epic, the Babylonians. Our Torah has a wrestling match too. The wrestling match is between Jacob and somebody. Now, in previous portions to this story, Jacob had cheated his father and his brother, Esau and Isaac. He was running for his life. He finds out that Esau, his brother, is coming to him with 400 armed men. So he moves away from his camp to protect them, and the Torah says that at night he has a wrestling match with some being. And it's a very mysterious story because the being wrenches Jacob's hip. Jacob asks for a blessing. This being changes Jacob's name to Israel. And uh, the being asks Jacob to let him go because nobody's winning this match because the dawn is breaking. Kind of sounds like Transylvania. And then it says Jacob names the place Peniel because Panim, face, El is God. I saw the face of God and prevailed. Now, traditionally, the commentators explain the story that he wrestled with the angel of Asaph, kind of a pre-battle engagement. Uh, some, it seems like he wrestled with an angel, wrestled with God, and they usually interpret Yisrael there that he wrestled with God and won, or he strove with God and won. But there's a very different alternative explanation that I want to base this message on. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew, and Targum Unculus, as well as other Targumim, which are ancient Aramaic translations and commentaries, because when you translate something from one language to another, you comment on it, because it's not exactly the same language, have a different idea. That it's not that Jacob was wrestling against this foe, but that God and the angel were on Jacob's side. Now, was this a dream? Was it an actual match? And if so, with whom? But the point of the text and the understandings of the Hebrew there, that, he, that God and the angel were on Jacob's side, and that Jacob, and that when you say Yisrael, it doesn't mean he wrestled with God. Israel would be three words. Is would be Ish, man, Ra, so El, God. And that's what it says in the next verse, that he named it Peniel, he saw the face of God. Now, we don't see the face of God. God has no face. So he saw God. What does that mean? It's kind of like the last week's story with the ladder, where he woke up and he said, God was in this place and I didn't know it. This was a confirming story, that he had a match with himself. He was wrestling with the kind of person he was going to be. And he finally let the side of God win, and he saw God and was transformed by it. Now, how does this apply to our daily life and our life all the time? Well, God implanted within us two aspects. Freud said it was three, the id, the superego, and the ego. But the rabbis understood it was two. The Yetzir HaTov and Yetzir HaRa, and I have another video on that. The good inclination and the evil inclination. And we constantly are hearing voices. One voice says yes, and one voice says no. God implants within us the knowledge, the still small voice, of how to function in life. And to our great regret, we all often let our Yetzir HaRa overcome our Yetzir HaTov. We ignore the still small voice. This applies in so many areas of our life. In fact, Pirkei Avot, the great wisdom of the sages, says, who is a gibur? A gibur, a hero. It's not the biggest, strongest guy who can pin you in three seconds. It's HaKovesh Yitzro, the one who conquers his voice saying, go ahead and do it. For example, Thanksgiving. I'm doing this right after Thanksgiving. Uh, my wife uh, read an article in the paper that said the average person eats 4,500 calories on Thanksgiving. And then you set an alarm clock and you get up at 2 in the morning or midnight and you go rush off to buy a bunch of things that uh, on sale that you probably can't afford anyway. You run up your credit card bill. 
Maybe you're grumpy and grouchy. You don't think how you're going to talk to your family. There's so much family around. It's a tough time for some people. And these are all examples of where we let, or you drink too much. You're about to be holiday parties. People do stupid things because they drink too much. Every one of these cases where God is planting this voice saying, you know the right thing to do. You know the right thing to do. Listen to that still small voice. You're thinking about having that second drink. There's a nagging voice that says, don't do it. Usually ignore it. Listen to it. You don't have to eat the uh, second helping. That's one of my big problems, too. I, I ignore that small voice about uh, food all the time, to my uh, regret. Or you know when your your tone is wrong, your harsh words, you can overcome that. You can listen to that still small voice. God wants us to be the best we can. God's not putting little paths, difficulties in our path to make our life more difficult. I love the scene in Fiddler on the Roof where Tevya says he's having a tough time. He had a pogrom at his daughter's wedding. He, uh, his third daughter married out of the faith. His second daughter married as a communist who's off in Siberia being arrested. His first daughter didn't do exactly what he said. His wife is nagging him. His horse is a bad foot. He's poor. So he says, God, I think sometimes when things are too peaceful for you, you look down and say, what trouble can I make for Tevya? Well, God doesn't function that way. It's cute, but God wants us to live the best and easiest life we can, and God sends us messages. Here's what to do. Now, it doesn't mean that immediately things will go your way, and it doesn't mean over the course of your lifetime you won't have any difficulty. But when we get on God's path, with which is clearly in the Torah, is following the mitzvot, we listen, and all God gives us free will, so all we can do is listen to that still, small voice saying, you know what to do. You're about to make a purchase, and the voice says, you can't afford this. Listen to that voice. You're about to say something, and a voice says to you, you know, you shouldn't talk that harshly to your family or your friends. Or you're about to do something where you're going to cheat somebody in business, and a voice says, you know, that's really not right, but your desire for greed overcomes that. Listen to the still, small voice. Listen to God saying, you know what to do here. Don't do it. And in my life, like everybody else's life, I've sometimes not listened to that voice, and it's caused problems. I remember distinctly, I was going to buy a, a car, and uh, I had a perfectly good car, and I'm thinking, I really want this car. And a voice says, you know, this is way too expensive. It's going to hurt. And I went ahead, and I, as I was just about to sign the thing, I finally, finally, this voice said, do it. This voice said, don't do it. I said, you know what, I'm not going to go through with this. Because, and, I was, and every time... I don't always succeed here. Every time I pass by a brownie or something, and I, it voices, don't do it, you'll regret it. And so the trick is to build up that side with Torah, to wrestle ourselves with God's help on our side and the angels on our side on helping us live a better life. That, I think, is really one of the great messages of the wrestling match with Jacob.